شعت شموس الهدي بالكلمات فنارت الأفهام بالآيات أسرج بنور العلم عقلا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين. Among the questions that we ask often ourselves is what are our obligations towards the master of martyrs, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and his noble household. Inshallah, I will address several of these obligations, which are considered one of the easiest obligations. The great sacrifices and actions were performed by our forefathers. Some of them were beheaded, others had their hands chopped off, their legs chopped off, others were hanged to death, and yet they stopped at no limit for the sake of Imam Hussein salam and his great tragedies. There are some individuals that have boundaries when it comes to dealing with Imam Hussein salam and Almighty Allah and his beloved messengers. They act within these boundaries. However, our forefathers did not place any limits for their relationship with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And they endured everything, the great hardships and struggles. Therefore, as we stated, the deeds and obligations that we will discuss tonight will be among the easiest of the deeds and the easiest of the obligations. The first obligation is the financial participation. Regardless of your financial capability, whether you're poor, you're wealthy, each one of us must and should dedicate a percentage of their wealth that they will share with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. It can be 1%, it can be 10%, it can be 20%. According to what some scholars say, that some people pay hummus twice a year. They pay the first 20% as part of their yearly obligation for the sake of Allah, and they pay the second 20% for the sake of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Ultimately, those individuals pay about a sum of 40% of their yearly income. This notion of financial participation was introduced by Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam was once on a journey with a group of people. And some of those who were traveling with the Imam were carrying money with them. And during those days, the roads were not safe, yet thieves used to attack the caravan and the travelers used to take every, everything with them in case they would get stolen. So these individuals who were with the Imam alayhi salam, Imam Sadiq, they told the Imam that we are afraid that our money gets stolen from thieves that appear on our way and we want to leave the money with you. The Imam rejected and he said, maybe those looters who will attack you will attack me as well and take the money. They said then, we shall bury the money somewhere. The Imam said to them, but it's possible that anyone can come and dig out the money and find the money. Or it's possible that you will forget the place where you buried or the direction where you buried your money. In both cases, you will lose your money. The men said, then what should we do? The Imam replied, he said, deposit your interest money with whomever doesn't lose money and trust. The men asked, and who is he? The Imam replied, Allah. They replied, how do we entrust our money with him? The Imam replied and he said, by paying one third of the money to the poor. Now they're, in, they're on their way in the desert. They're like, how do we pay one third of the money to the poor when there are no poor amongst us? The, the Imam said to them, intent, make an intention that if you pass the road safe and you end your trip safely, one third of your money will be given to the poor. All the men made their intention 
and they went on their way, they witnessed a thief approaching them. They were afraid. They said to the Imam that those thieves are approaching us. The Imam said to them, how could you fear when Allah is protecting you? Those looters, they came and they approached the Imam and they kissed his hands and they told him, one of them told the Imam that I saw the Prophet in my dream and he told me to be at your service. And we are here being at your service. And if you want us to, defer, to deter other looters from your caravan, we will accompany you. The Imam replied to them and he said, there is no need for you. The one who deterred you from harming us will deter others from harming us as well. They arrived to their destination. Those men paid one third of their money to the poor. According to the hadith, those men who paid each dirham to the poor have profited 10 dirhams for each dirham they gave to the poor. Have you witnessed the blessings and doing business with Allah? Have you witnessed doing business with Imam Hussein salam? There was once a man who was stuck with a complicated business deal. There was no way out of it and there was no hope. So what he did is he turned to Allah and pledged to Abu al-Fadl Abbas salam, and his brother Imam al Hussein, and he said that he would dedicate one third of his wealth to them if this problem was revealed. Through the help of Allah, he was able to get out of the hardship that he was going through. And he has fulfilled his pledge to the last day of his life, meaning any money he would earn, he would dedicate one third of it to Imam Hussein السلام, and to his brother Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. This is the first obligation. It's the easiest, the financial obligation. Each one of us should contribute financially to Imam Hussein السلام, even if it was a small amount. Even if it was 1%, that 1% will cause blessings and mercy. The second obligation is participating with children. One of us should vow one of their child to become a servant for Imam Hussein This is the second obligation. A man narrates once, he said that when I was a little child, around maybe eight years of his age, he said, I saw Sayyid Muhammad al-Shirazi on certain occasions. And Sayyid Muhammad asked him, the Sheikh narrates, he asked him, what is your name? The man replied, or the little boy replied, he said his name. And Sayyid Muhammad said, do you know that there is a scholar, a great scholar who shares your name? And he writes an outstanding books in several volumes. He said, you should be like him one day. The man is narrating. He said, in my mind, he influenced me from my childhood till today. Don't say that he or she is a child, that those men and women who are governing this world today were children. A single word can be so influential. That child is now grown and has been the great Shia speakers. A motivated child can bring and can be a defender of Islam. This is the second obligation. The first one is financially, the second one is participating with children and motivating them, vowing, vowing one of them to become a servant for Imam Hussein salam. The third obligation is personal participation. That one would participate in anything that is related with Imam Hussein salam. Anything, in, in many varieties, in many different ways. This participation can be done through many different forms. As I mentioned before, we should not place limits to the relationship with Imam Hussein salam. For example, participation can be simple as reciting Ziyarat Ashura. That's one way to interact and participate with Imam Hussein salam and his cause. Another story narrated by a man and on the day of judgment, we may, be, we may invade these individuals. He said that his mother 
would always recite Ziyarat Ashura for 30 years. Every single day. And she did not miss it, not even once. He said one day she decided to go to Mashhad to visit Imam Rada During the days of Muharram, she went to Mashhad and she died on the 10th day of Muharram and was buried in the shrine of Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. This will be presented before us one day on Day of Judgment, where some of us don't even read Ziyarat Ashura, not even once in our lives. Wouldn't we invade this woman for her status? These are all personal participation with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Another woman who would read Ziyarat Ashura or another woman who read Ziyarat Ashura for 10 years and she reads it twice a day. So she reads it morning and night because she wants to make up for the days that she didn't read. Imagine participating and interacting in all different forms without any limits. When it comes to Imam Hussein alayhi salam, there must be no limits. People, when they get older, they start to place limits and boundaries for themselves. Sheikh Wahid al-Khurasani, he mentions the story and he says that many of our great scholars depend on a fatwa. If he had to consent among three scholars and they would issue their opinion according to the fatwa, meaning that based on the consensus, they would be assured that there is credible evidence since those scholars are precious and pious who are Sayyid Mirza or our Mirza Shirazi, a scholar and the leader of Iran's tobacco revolution, and Mirza Muhammad Taqiya Shirazi, who is a scholar from the 19th and 20th century, who led the great against British occupation in Iraq. If those three would agree on specific religious ruling, other scholars would issue their fatwa and rulings according to theirs. As you are aware that the Sheikh Muhammad Taqi al-Shirazi was a supreme religious authority for the Shia Muslims and had led one of the great revolutions in history. So he was both a religious and a political leader. Yet the Mirza would do something on the 10th day of Muharram, which most of us wouldn't do. He would come out from his house barefooted, without a turban, and he would walk and mourn with the marchers. He would walk and mourn Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and he would beat his chest. Sheikh Wahid says, that Mirza has extensive knowledge he would see the hadith of Imam Rida alayhi salam saying, Inna yawm al Hussein akra hajufunana. The day of Ashura, the day of Imam Hussein, has injured our eyes and shed our tears. The eyelid is the most sensitive and delicate part of the body. How much would someone have to cry in order for their eyelid to be injured? I still haven't witnessed anyone who injured their eyelids due to excessive crying. Imam Rida alayhi salam says the day of Ashura has injured our eyelids. In Ziyarat al-Nahya al-Muqaddasa for Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, it says, dama. I will lament you every morning and every evening and will weep blood instead of tears. Meaning due to excessive crying, his tears would come out blood. Therefore, it's not strange for Mirza Taqish Shirazi to come out barefooted on the day of Ashura. Sayyid Bahr al-Uloom, he threw his turban and his cane and he started marching with the people and beating his chest. The students who were accompanying him tried to prevent him and told him, this doesn't suit you. You're a great scholar. Later, he was asked for the reason behind his action. He said, I witnessed with my own eyes Imam al Mahdi barefooted, with no amama, no turban, marching with those marchers. Thus, 
Imam al-Mahdi participates in such rituals and such programs. What are our excuses for not participating? We should not place any limits when it comes to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And we should make majalis and serve food. Therefore, this is the third obligation. We should participate in various forms and method of participating without any limits. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, to grant us with success for such a task. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabina Muhammadin wa ala ali bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin. في دعاء الإمام صلوات الله عليه الإمام الحجة يخاطب جده الإمام الحسين صلوات الله عليه فلا أندبنك صباحا ومساء هل يستفاد من هذه الجملة أنه يستحب أن نندب الإمام الحسين صباحا ومساء ولو بمقدار أنه واحد عندما يقوم من النوم يقول وا حسيناه وبالليل يقول ذلك من باب أن الإمام صلوات الله عليه أصالة الأسوة جارية في أعماله